Greetings. This is Caroline Staten with Transition U.S., and thank you for joining our online event today. Our principal aim is to provide practical support to leaders of transition initiatives, those mulling over starting an initiative, and community leaders everywhere working on resilience building within their communities. We want to continue to offer webinars at no cost and ask that you consider making a donation at transitionus.org. And thank you in advance for those of you who are able to do this. The TELUS seminar today is called The Art of Hosting, Exploring a Framework for Working with Complexity. And this seminar will explore the Cunovan framework a model used to help organizations and communities make good decisions and create useful actions, especially when working with complexity. We'll cover theory of complex decisions and explore various forms of leadership needed in different contexts. And this will lead us into a discussion of the role of participatory leadership and dialogue based leadership in addressing complex challenges. And we have Chris with us today for about 60 minutes, and we'll have some time for Q&A as well. So let me introduce Chris. Uh, Chris Corrigan is an art of hosting practitioner and has more than 20 years experience working with participatory methodologies in indigenous communities, aboriginal organizations, nonprofits, and with government and business clients. He has worked with Transition Town organizers in Canada and Ireland and has supported the use of open space technology with special transition initiatives in North America. He lives on Bowen Island in British Columbia, and you can read more about him and download resources and tools uh, of his work at chriscorrigan.com. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to you, Chris, and thank you so much for joining us today and really look forward to uh, learning about this framework. You're welcome. So thank you, Carolyn, and good morning, everyone. I see uh, Carolyn and I have um, a kind of a control panel for the conference call, and we can see names, and I see that there's at least two of my neighbors who are on this call as well from Bowen Island. So hi, Pauline and Dave. Um, as well as folks from all over the place. So it's good to, um, good to be speaking with you. I um, was asked to uh, uh, share kind of my experiences with and, and, and uses of this, this framework, the Kinnivan framework, which found is, um, is a really useful way of beginning to uh, uh, think about decisions, think about um, how to plan and design initiatives. It's kind of a big macro framework for understanding the, the different kinds of problems that we, um, that we face in, in the world and in, in, a, in a whole bunch of uh, different, different domains and settings. And part of this is to lead into the teleseminar that um, Carolyn talked about um, with, on May 9th with Teresa and Tennyson. We'll be talking about participatory leadership methodologies um, the art of hosting, so you've heard the word, you've heard the term, the art of hosting is a, uh, an approach to participatory leadership um, from facilitation all the way to organizing large-scale systemic work that um, has some core practices at its, at its center, and those practices, um, those practices help us to be able to deploy tools and methodologies, and it's based and rooted in a worldview that, that um, works specifically with complex systems. Um, and so the Kinevin framework uh, that I want to introduce to you guys today is a way of understanding um, complexity and complexity in relation to other forms of, um, other forms of problem solving and other ways of knowing where you are. So if you want to follow along, um, if I could draw this out, I would. And I'm usually, I usually, uh, I usually do, actually. So what I'm going to invite you to do is if you've got a pen, a piece of paper handy or something you can scratch on or you're sitting by the side of the road and you can draw it in the, in the dirt, um, take, a, take, a, take a pen and draw it. I'm going to invite you to draw a diamond, first of all. And from that diamond, from the points of the diamond, you can extend four lines that come out so that it looks like we've divided the page or the paper into kind of five zones. 
Um, <clears throat> if you saw on the um, on the Transition US uh, web page that invited you into this, there'll be there was a diagram of the Kniffen framework. The Kniffen framework consists of five domains, and so we can label them now. You can start if you start on the bottom right. Um, you can label that one simple, and the one above that on the top right, you can label that one complicated, and the one on the top left, uh, name that one complex. The one on the bottom left, you can name chaotic, and the one in the middle, you can call disorder. And I want to talk a little bit about what these what these are. So part of this. The beauty of this framework, I think, is that it allows us to see that situations that we're facing have aspects and decisions that we have to make um, that exist in all five of these domains. The Kniffen, the word Kniffen is a Welsh word that means your place of multiple belongings. Um, it's a really good indigenous word. It's, um, it indicates that we all of us come from different places and all of our who we are as individuals is made up from all of those different belongings that we experience. And so it's a really good word that was chosen by a Welsh uh, thinker and practitioner, David Snowden, um, to name uh, a framework that understands that any problem we face can be understood to have aspects of itself in each of these five domains. So the first thing I want to say right off the bat is that this isn't a, a categorization framework. This isn't, um, this isn't like a four by four matrix where if you just get it right, you can plug it into this one uh, quadrant and then you can proceed from there. Every problem and situation that we face as humans and organizations and communities will have aspects of all five of these domains. And in each of these five domains, it requires different forms of leadership, different forms of decision making. And this is how we use the framework to understand uh, where to use uh, the right kinds of tools and, and, and processes and the right kinds of questions and the right kinds of leadership to, um, you know, just to address what we're facing. So let me speak a little bit about each of these domains first of all. The simple domain, we can understand each of these domains by the relationship between causes and effects. Okay? So basically, in a simple domain, the cause and the effect are really clear. So an example of that would be um, turning a tap off, turning a tap on and off. It's the kind of thing where you don't even really have to think about it. The cause and the effect is really clear. When I turn the tap, the water comes out. When I turn it the other way, the water stops running. So that's a, an example of a simple system. And in simple systems, we can benefit easily from best practices because the whole system is knowable the whole system is completely understandable, and every time we turn the tap, it will work the same way every single time. Um, and so that's a simple system. A complicated system is, for example, what happens when your tap doesn't work. So if you keep doing the best practice of turning the tap on and off, and one day it just doesn't stop the water from flowing, then you have a problem on your hands. Uh, and unless you're a plumber, you probably require some form of technical expertise and outside uh, analysis to figure out what's going on. So in the complicated domain, it's still very much knowable. It's still very much uh, an ordered system. And in fact, this is the domain of technical and, and engineering problems. If we just get the right minds in the room, the people who can do the right analysis, if we gather the right um, data, then we can probably come up with one or more fixes for the situation that are going to be adequate, you know, if not good. And so this is the domain of good practice, not best practice, but good practice, because there's maybe more than one way that you can do this. So if your water is keeping running on your tap, um, you know, you might have to change the tap. You might have to, uh, might be a problem with your uh, water supply. It could be a problem with your plumbing underneath. Um, so there could be a whole bunch of different causes. And if, if you don't know your way around a plumbing system, it's advisable to get a plumber. So in, in these kinds of situations, it's very useful to have expertise come in um, to work with the data that you have, to work with the data that's knowable. And if you don't know how to gather information, then to get somebody who can help you gather the information so you can make a good decision. This is a privileged domain in um, North American, and I would say Western European society. It's a privileged domain because it's the domain in which scientific materialism as a view, as a way of seeing, 
is really um, has really been the greatest gift to humanity. It's our way we figured out how to really survive in the complicated domain with tremendous um, virtuosity, I would say. So that's cool. So that gets a lot of a lot of privilege and a lot of default settings, and I'll come back to that in a minute. On the other side, if you move over the boundary between complicated to complex, then you're into something that is um, getting really tricky. So in the other two domains, you can see that the cause and the effect are knowable. Um, it's just a different degrees of how knowable and how immediately apparent they are. In the complex domain, causes and effects are very difficult to tease apart. We can do it retroactively. So you can look at an effect. You can look at something that has happened in the world, and you can trace, out, um, trace back the, the root causes. Um, but that kind of, um, and that technique is called retroactive coherence. So in other words, we make sense of, a, of an outcome based on what happened. And we can go back and we can go, ah, oh, this, this is where that came from. But that shouldn't fool us into predicting that we can imagine that we can see causes now and we can see what the emergent effects are going to be in the future. And this is, um, this is one of the, I don't even know what you would call this, the fallacy, this logical fallacy that, that um, that goes ahead, but I would call it maybe the fallacy of retroactive coherence. So that, that we understand how things have occurred to get us to this situation gives us the false confidence that if we just apply that same level of knowing to the future, we can know what's going to happen. In a complex system, the primary characteristic of a complex system is emergence. And you know we see emergence around us all the time, and we see it in living systems, we see it in forests, we see it in gardens, we see it in communities, we see it in markets. We see living, living systems all over the place where um, we get hit by surprises all the time. There's this term, the black swan event. Well, black swan events, which are, which are um, large deviations from the expected future, are just simply emergent properties of um, complex systems. Uh, there's always a chance that we're going to get surprised. So emergence is um, kind of a fickle partner to work with. Emergence can be something that's... Uh, uh, can be a problem that can also be a place of incredible innovation. When we, um, we're working in emergent systems, we need to be, I mean, it just lends a whole different um, set of leadership skills and a set of knowing about the world and viewing, uh, ways of viewing the world, um, ontologies and epistemologies. And so I'm going to come back to it and I'm going to talk about this, but this is really where the domain of participatory leadership can live. Um, technical solutions don't generally do so well in a complex system. So for example, I'll give you an example. On, right here on Bowen Island, uh, where I live and where Pauline and Dave live, we have, um, we have a developer who uh, is very good at building houses and uh, builds a lot of houses, um, but calls himself a community builder. And um, it always kind of rankles me a little bit that uh, we would equate the technical ability to construct houses with the uh, the capacity to build communities. So I'm, I'm of, the, of the belief that communities are emergent. You cannot plan a community, but you can build a neighborhood. Um, but it's not the job of the developer, of the builder of houses, to create a, a, a neighborhood, although they can influence how a neighborhood evolves, obviously, by creating, um, by creating initial conditions. So you can create a suburban sprawl kind of situation, and that's going to... Uh, limit the way in which a community might emerge, and you can create villages, and th that will also constrain the way in which um, the way in which uh, communities emerge. But community is an emergent property uh, of that system that includes the built physical built environment as well as a whole bunch of other things. Okay, so that's the complex domain, and I'm going to go around to the chaotic and the disordered domain before I come back to these as well. So in the chaotic domain, the chaotic domain is. Um, the place where cause and effect just don't make any sense at all. It's impossible to make sense of the situation. Um, a good example is if you're in a riot, and there's high degrees of chaos in a riot. Um, you just don't know what to do, and so you're called to just do something. Um, I sometimes say that in the southern United States, the idea of uh, uh, chaos is sometimes called Katrina. So if you look at what happened in Katrina, you look at what happens in uh, Japan after the tsunami and in other places, you just see these high degrees of chaos. There's no way you will ever have, have ever been in this situation before, and it's unlikely that you're ever going to be in this situation again. So that calls for a very different kind of acting. It calls for what's called novel practice. 
It's the domain of um, complexity asks us for emergent practice, practice that emerges. Uh, in, a, in the chaotic domain, it's going to be novel practice. It's going to be something that you've never done before and something you'll probably never do again. Finally, the last one in the middle is uh, the, the domain of disorder. And the domain of disorder is a really important one. It's, this is what makes it not a four by four matrix, but a five domain uh, framework. The domain of disorder is simply um, decisions and situations you confront in your life when you just really don't understand what's going on. And so I'll give you an example. I sometimes use this framework as a way of working with organizations and communities to kind of map out like all of the characteristics of the system. So we'll do a little exercise where we sit down um, uh, planning the future of an organization, for example, and we'll sit down and we'll tell stories, anecdotes with one another and harvest from those anecdotes different insights about the way in which the system works. And then we use this uh, framework to uh, uh, begin to see which of the situations we're in and which of the decisions we face are simple, complicated, complex, chaotic, or, or, or disordered. And the way we do that is we just take, for example, all the headlines of anecdotes, put them on post-it notes, throw them in the disordered domain, and begin kind of clustering them and moving them out and beginning to look at the, at the uh, relationships between them so that we get a sense of where we need to act and how we need to act. And there's always something left in the disordered domain. So uh, time I did this recently, and we were talking about social, the future of social services um, in the province of British Columbia. And somebody had uh, been telling a story uh, and harvested the story with a headline that said, economic dictation. And so that one stayed in the disordered domain because nobody could understand what economic dictation meant. It could mean that um, the problem was that our economies were being dictated to by large corporations. It could also mean that we need to become better um, at talking about our economic plans and ideas. Um, and then somebody else even interpreted it as, um, oh, we need, a, we need a cheap way to record um, meetings so that we can transcribe them. So it was that kind of you know, secretarial dictation. So it's really interesting about the disordered domain is that when we're confronted with uh, problems like that and we don't understand where we are, we'll always default to what we assume that is going to be. And that can often lead us in a radically different ways. If one of us is talking about uh, you know, like fascism and the other one is talking about a cheap tape recorder, then you know, we really have to get on board and try and figure out what we mean by those things. But if we don't do that, then we can make these fatal mistakes of pursuing a cheap tape recorder when what we're really talking about is creeping corporatism. So um, those are the domains. That's how, they, that's how they play out and the forms of leadership that are required in each one of them, um, especially in the four on the outside of the diamond. Uh, each one of those domains uh, requires very different forms of leadership. So I think I'm going to just talk a little bit about what that looks like and then I'll open it up for some questions. Um, in the, uh, if, you're, if you can go on the Wikipedia page for Canivener, you can look at that diagram that was included on the Transition US website invitation for this call. You'll see that there are um, um, sort of a type, typologies of action that I guess is how I would describe them in each of these domains. So in the simple domain, <clears throat> it says best practice proceeds from um, sensing, categorizing, and responding. And so what that means is if you're in a simple system, the decisions you need to make, first of all, are to sense what's happening in the system, figure out what's going on, categorize your responses, and then choose one, choose the best one. So in the case of the tap in the running water, the simple, uh, the simple solution there is you could, you could look and say, oh, the, the, the tap is running, but I think what I need to do is to, um, uh, I could turn the tap, I could stop it up with some gum or adhesive. I could go downstairs and shut off the water main. I mean, there's a bunch of different ways I can get the water to stop flowing, but I think the best one is just to turn the tap. Now, in the simple system, most of the time, we're not going to go through that, that process, um, or at least if we do, it's instantaneous. So we just know to turn the tap off. That's what makes it a simple system. But that's what's going on. Is you, you're essentially looking at the situation, that's the sensing part, you're weighing your options and then you're choosing the best practice. And if you've ever turned a tap off before, you're going to know how to do it. In a complicated system, it moves from, uh, instead of just categorizing responses, we need to do an analysis. So there's a sensing, analysis, and then a response. And so this is handy for technical problems like building a bridge, creating a house, uh, for example. 
um, doing accounting, um, choosing a financial model. These are all technical pieces of work. This is where technical leadership is, is quite excellent. People who know how to do things, how to manipulate things, people who know how to make the world they're working in completely knowable. So it's a mystery to me how to build a house because I'm not a house builder. And so when I see house builders coming over and doing renovations on my place, I'm incredibly impressed by their ability to translate what it is that I want to see into completely doable, easy next steps. I was one time uh, working with, uh, um, in, in uh, Seattle with Boeing, and, and this aircraft engineer gave me a tour of the assembly building. And you know, building a 737 is a complicated process, to say the least. But the job that engineers do in building aircraft and in building huge other pieces of technology is to just break it down into a bunch of steps. And so on the, on, on the um, floor of the assembly building um, in Everett, where they build 737s uh, and 747s, they have basically big Gantt charts, big to-do lists of simple tasks to do that costs them hundreds of millions of dollars of, in talent um, to be able to put together. But at the end of the day, it's just like put this rivet here, take, tack this down, attach this to that. Um, and so on, and so it just becomes a series of simple tasks. But that, so that's the, that's the beauty of the complicated domain. In the complex domain, emergent practice arises not from sensing the system first, because we can't understand the whole system. So it doesn't make sense to sort of sit around and say, well, we just need to gather enough data, and then we'll know what to do. And this is, this is where we often get into trouble um, when we tr choose social science approaches to complex problems. So for example, Poverty, racism, uh, stigma are all complex problems. I'll give you the example of stigma because I'll it, it, just tell a little story. When we, um, a few years ago, I did a project for Vancouver Coastal Health, which is the, the, um, the, uh, the public health authority that looks after health care in, in the Vancouver Coastal Region. <clears throat> Vancouver Coastal Health was noticing that people with addictions, um, drug addictions, were having uh, worse health outcomes than people without drug addictions. And uh, they attributed these worth, uh, worse health outcomes to the stigma that was being attached to people with addictions as they came into the system by healthcare providers. And so, uh, for example, if you have a, a heroin addiction and you show up at an emergency ward with a broken arm and you're sitting next to somebody that doesn't have a heroin addiction and has the same broken arm, you're likely that to receive worse health care than the person who doesn't have the heroin addiction. Um, and so addressing stigma became like a, a major, um, sort of a major problem. How do we address it? Because you can't find anybody that wakes up in the morning and says, oh, I'm just going to go out and stigmatize people with addictions today. Um, and yet it's present and it's working. It's an emergent phenomenon. And so you can't, because you can't know it, because there's a huge amount of unknowability in this domain, what you need to do, first of all, uh, instead of sensing, is you need to begin probing the system. So you need to start with some experiments that will tell you a little bit about uh, the system that you're working with. So we did this in a couple of ways. We did do some research, and we found out, and we correlated these two numbers, which were really interesting, the numbers about uh, the health outcomes of people with addictions, and there was another number that we found out. And we discovered that in the healthcare system, in Vancouver Coastal Health, 70% of healthcare practitioners also have addictions. And that, that gave us a clue about how we could address this problem because if you believe in the idea that healthcare is structured around a hierarchy of care where, where healthy people are looking after people that are sick, then you get, you get into this kind of delusion that um, all we have to do is get the healthy people to apply solutions to the sick people, right? It's a technical solution to healthcare issues. What in reality is happening, especially around the, the question of um, addictions, is that we see that people with addictions are uh, caring for each other. So if 70% of the healthcare practitioners have addictions, and these addictions are not um, necessarily uh, addictions to heroin or, or illegal drugs. Some of them are addictions to food. Some of them are addictions to work. Many healthcare practitioners are workaholics that's built into their training. Um, and if you haven't dealt with your own addictions, um, then you can easily project them onto others. And so we were finding that as this completely subconscious practice, the practice of projecting one's shadow onto another person was resulting in lower health outcomes. And so that gave us uh, actually a lot of hope because we were able then to, in to invite a community of people with addictions to come and talk about how to address stigma. 
rather than just inviting healthy people and sick people to come and do it. <clears throat> we found a way past the idea that there could be a hierarchy of care. So um, what we did was we held an open space meeting which uh, over a day and a half, which the intention of which was to create prototypes, experiments, things that we could try that if we, pro we used them to probe the system, we could learn something about how stigma works. So creating probes, then sensing what's going on, and then responding by either amplifying what's working or dampening what's not working. That's how you get to emergent practice. So and this is really where the field of what's now being called adaptive leadership really excels. Dialogic leadership excels here. Um, human beings being in conversation are the ways that we've always made meaning and figured out what to do when we're confronted with complexity, when we're confronted with situations where we're confused, where we don't know what to do and we don't know where we're going. To sit down and to tell stories, to talk with one another, to make meaning, and then to choose a way forward is, is kind of an ancient human practice. It's different from bringing in an expert who knows exactly how to address stigma because everything that happens in the complex domain is so context dependent that you can't import a best practice from one place to another. And, you know, did a lot of work in the nonprofit sector and we use the term best practices, we kind of throw it around all the time. Um, best practices end up um, not being able to be replicated, of course, because the context is so radically different. So we need to be in situations where we're creating emergent practice. So that's the, <clears throat> the leadership piece in the complex domain. And in the chaotic domain, um, it's simply act, sense, and respond. So if you're in the middle of a riot, it doesn't do any good to sit down on the ground and draw a Kniven framework and to organize all of your responses to all the various situations that are going on. You mostly want to get yourself to a place of safety. And um, get, out, get out of the <laughs> line of fire, take cover, and then assess where you're at and notice that uh, your house is either on this side of the riot or on the other side of the riot. And it's, if it's on this side of the riot, then all you need to do is, is go home. If it's on the other side of the riot, then you've got a more complicated problem and you've got to figure out how to get from here to there without getting hurt. But the first thing you need to do is get yourself out of some, um, get yourself out of some, uh, out of danger. So, um, so acting and sensing and responding is how we respond in the chaotic domain. If we confuse these domains, if we take um, the wrong leadership uh, forms in the, in the wrong domain, then we actually find ourselves getting really stuck. So if we have a series of technical and complicated problems, but we try and do a long-term community process around them, we're going to find ourselves feeling like we're spinning our wheels, feeling like we're not really getting anywhere, feeling like this should be easier than it really is. On the other hand, if we look at a complex problem in society like racism or stigma or um, uh, transitioning from one economic system to another and we just imagine that all we need to do is implement a technical fix, then we're going to feel, uh, well, the chances that we're going to be right are slim, but we're also going to be feeling, um, I think, like it's being, um, like it's a reductionist kind of a way of looking at things. It doesn't allow for innovation. It doesn't allow for the kind of emergent, you know, the Einstein quote about the solving problems at the level of thinking beyond which they've been, they've been created. So, um, yeah, I think that, I mean, that's how the framework works. And I like to draw this framework out for folks when we're using participatory and dialogic methods to say that, uh, you know, it's great to have experts available when, when we're faced with technical problems and then when we're faced with complex problems, we need to be, this is where participatory leadership, adaptive leadership, dialogic leadership, all excels. And, uh, and so uh, it's a way of, I guess, maybe in some ways countering the privilege that the, the scientific materialist solution space uh, is granted all the time in our, in our world and being able to open up space for why and how participatory leadership methods may be, may be useful. So I think I'm going to leave it there and um, see if there are any questions that people have, uh, any conversation that, you know, insights and reflections that um, uh, just how this is striking you. So uh, I'll stop speaking and just open space for reflections. Thank you so much, Chris. This is Caroline again. And just want to let people know that they can press 1 on their keypads and that shows up on our screen. And we can mic you and give you the floor. So any questions or comments, press 1 on your keypad. Floor is open.
Julie, uh, please go ahead. Hi. Yeah, I'm wondering um, how one, like how a disordered system presents differently from a chaotic system. They seem very similar. Yeah. So um, disordered. Sometimes uh, uh, Dave Snowden in the creation of the Kinevan framework called that center domain disordered. Sometimes I call it WTF. Um, so, like, I just don't understand. Like, that's what you're, that's what you're looking at. So it's different from chaotic. So again, um, a disor- one, another way of thinking about a disordered system is when you're confronted with a particular situation and you haven't thought about whether it fits into one of the other four domains, you're going to generally lead out of what you know. And so I'm going to speak really broadly here in terms of massive generalizations here just to give you a sense of what I mean. But if you're an engineer, an engineering mindset brought to any problem will use the kind of like data analysis, um, build the solution. So it's a problem solving kind of a a situation. And so that can be a real worldview thing. If you're you're an artist like myself and my friend Pauline, (laughs) who's also on this call, then, um, then any situation that presents itself, as artists we can get really carried away and go, oh, this is a perfect opportunity for us to um, create an emergent practice and, and to, to just sort of see the art part of it, see the beauty of it. Beauty is an emergent process. And so, so us as artists, you know, we're really comfortable in the complex domain, which is not such a great place to be when you're building a bridge. But if you, so, so in other words, things that lie in the disordered system until we agree on which domain that they're in, they, they can be really contentious um, because we're bringing our own worldviews to bear on them. So, um, so I think that's what I want to say. I think Dave Snowden, who's written extensively about this, and you can, you can see lots of stuff on his blog at Cognitive Edge, will tell you that this is often the most difficult domain to grasp. But it's different from chaotic in that um, nobody can really agree on where we're at. And we may agree that what's in the middle is chaotic. We may also agree that it's simple. But until we agree, we're, it's a, it becomes problematic because we apply our own worldviews and, and then we get stuck in arguing about worldviews rather than arguing about the decision space that we're in. So hopefully that helps. Thank you, Chris. Um, To Janice Lynn. Hi. Um, These are really intriguing categories, and I'm wondering if you ever think about them in terms of, well, especially the leadership in terms of different personality types. Um, Well, I think it's important to... uh, no, I don't think about them in terms of personality types. And I, I don't think that's what the framework's intended to do. Um, and I don't want to leave well, the impression that it's in, in, t- intended to do that too. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just concerned about the, you know, that a leader in one domain would be effective where they wouldn't be in another. And if that has implications for personality. Right. I think, I think the main thing for me is that this is an argument for having a lot of diversity on your team. Because when you, um, and especially of having, so I'll give you an example. I was working with a, working with a, a church, a United Church. Um, and in this country, uh, the United Church of Canada is like a mainline Protestant denomination. And they're just, they're having a really hard time um, because that's the way things are for mainline Protestant denominations on this continent. Um, and uh, often when I'm working with the United Church, we get people that are really interested in the notion of community. So we're building community, we're supporting community, we're supporting spirit in community. So they're, they're investigating the way they can do community development as a spiritual community, and that's what they're up to. And then you often also get people who sit on the uh, board of a church and go, you know, we haven't got time for the spirit stuff. We, it's just a business meeting. We just got to get, like, we have things to manage. And that manage, you know, that, that sort of, used to be we would do this unfairly. We would say there's management and then there's leadership. And what I think, what I think is really meant by that is that there, are, there is leadership that is good at working with the knowable um, and the tangible. And then there's leadership that's good with working with the unknowable and the intangible. And um, the knowable, tangible leadership applies really well in the technical space, in the space of complicated problems. The, the untangible and unknowable kind of leadership works really well when we're facing a lot of mystery and a lot of complexity. And I think both are really, really useful because, as I said, um, you, can't just, you can't just break the situation that you're in into one of these five domains. They break into all five of these domains, 
right? So there's aspects of simplicity in everything you do. There's aspects of chaos in everything that you do, as well as complexity and complication. And so it's important to have people who are competent and who know their way around all kinds of different ways. For me, it's an argument for putting together good, diverse teams of people. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, to Ben Roberts. Hi, Caroline. Chris. Hi, Ben. Hi, Ben. Yeah, so thank you, Chris. It's really uh, fascinating to hear you describe this um, this framework. And I, I found myself, maybe it's that personality predilection that you talked about, uh, thinking about the complex domain, um, being drawn to it. I think it also is probably because you know, systemic transformation, here we are in transition, you know, a transition community. The, the, the big problems that we face, it seems to me, are, are, are in that category for the most part, the ones that we're really, you know, that we care most deeply about and are most worried about, have mm. this greatest sense of urgency. Um, and, and you also hear so often, right, this, this sense that uh, the statement, well, we actually know how to do this differently. We know how to produce all of our energy with renewables, or we know how to produce all our food sustainably. We're just not doing it. So that seems mm. like maybe an indication we're not in the complicated domain. Would that be a fair mm. statement? Yeah, because the, the technology of creating um, fossil free, fossil fuel free energy is there, right. you know, I mean, right. it's like, it's there. But how do we take it to scale? Why isn't the policy framework yeah, working for it? Why the market it? don't support it? Yeah. Right. And there's technical um, fixes to that. Like, if you have a trillion dollars, you can create a market, and that would be great, you know. <laughs> if you don't, then you have a complicated problem. <laughs> yeah, well, and that gets to the second comment I, would, I wanted to offer, and then a question. Um, so I've been reading this um, article that David Graeber recently posted. Um, the, the name of it is escaping me for the moment. But, um, but he, he makes the, the case that, that those in power are more invested with convincing us all that the system we've got can't change, that it won't change, that it's foolish to try and change it. You know, this particular form of kleptocratic corporate capitalism is the only thing we can do. And, and so there's all this energy put into making us think it's hopeless to, to, mm. to do anything else. And, and yet he suggests, of course, that's not really true, um, but, but it's succeeding almost as a PR campaign. And, and, um, and so I guess my question then coming out of that sense is, if, if probing is the first way to respond in these circumstances, to kind of test the system out and see what things mm. are worth amplifying and what things are you want to dampen down, can you say a little more about um, what, what, how to think about where and, and how to, to come up with probing ideas? Because it seems to me that the whole, when you're in this complex, messy situation, and particularly when this message is coming at you so forcefully that this is really pretty hopeless to try to change this, um, mm. it, it's hard to, we really, it's so precious to come up with the things that are worth doing, you know, that are worth our time and our energy and feel like they might actually make a difference. And of course, because it's complex, we don't know in advance. But, but there must be maybe some set of criteria you've developed out of experience or some, some way of sort of guiding that decision-making process in terms of where, where you want to focus that, that probing inquiry and energy. Right. That. So, um, so, I mean, I think that's kind of like leading into, in some ways, the next, I don't want to sort of tease out the next webinar, but it leads into the next webinar about why we think um, – Dialogic practice and participatory leadership is is a good thing to know how to do. I think I think the, the short answer to your question, Ben, is we need to become um, communities that learn. So in that sense, I think transition transition town movement in general is an incredible little innovation in our world because it's very small, it's very local, uh, it's connected widely, and it's people that are willing to sit in the chaos of or sit in the kind of mystery, I should say, of what's going, ha what's going to happen, of what's happening, and what's going to happen. And, and I think it's best served with a dose of um, not hope per se for the system, but faith in each other that we can get through what's coming. Mm -hmm. right. So when the folks that, you know, the folks that are engineering the system to be right now and telling us all that it's working just beautifully and this is our only option, have created a degree of brittleness that at some point it has to break. I mean, this is just the nature of these systems. They change and they shift and they go through radical phase shifts. And the more structure we put on them, the more catastrophic the, the, the collapse. I don't know when that's going to happen. You know, it could be my lifetime, my kid's lifetime, my grandkid's lifetime. I don't know. But, um, 
But I do know that if we're not probing around the edges of resiliency, uh, we're not going to be ready for it. And so I think having a long view, uh, transition towns and uh, are become a transition, the transition movement in general becomes a really good place to just be practicing together and learning and letting go of that, you know, just learning. So when stuff works, great. And when stuff doesn't work, great. You know, but we can, we're building a container whereby we can, we can create what Dave Snowden calls safe to fail, safe to fail activities. Um, and that means letting go of our addiction to success, letting go of our craving for knowable results. So this gets very difficult when you're working with funders, for example, because funders <laughs> love to be able to give you, I'll give you $40,000 and you can affect a 12% decrease in the literacy rates in this community. And then they give you the $12,000 and you lie to them. You write that you, you did what they wanted to do and then they feel really good and they give you the money again next year. And we get into this kind of game of playing, um, this, this game of making everything look knowable because that's what we want because we're addicted to accountability and all kinds of other things. So I think, I think kind of the answer to your question, Ben, is that we need to be creating learning communities where we are not just tolerant of failure, but we actually practice failing together in our experiments because, you know, just the capacity of being able to live with stuff that doesn't go all that well should be like one of the key resources that transition groups bring to the rest of the world, that we can actually survive through things that don't work the way we think that they're going to work because at a macro level, that's also what we're expecting. Um, and it's not a pessimistic, right? So, I mean, it's not a pessimistic or a cynical view, as I know many of you in transition communities know. It's, it's one that, that, you know, can really be charged with possibility. Um, and you do it because you know, you do it because you love it. So something like that. But I think the next webinar, I think, uh, I think the next webinar and the art of hosting, art of participatory leadership practices and uh, in that family of world and that, that family of leadership, adaptive leadership uh, is something of the answer to your question. Creating communities of practice, communities of learning and adaptive leadership. Yeah, thank wow. you. I'm hearing a lot of echoes of Meg Wheatley's So Far From Home and what you were just saying. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think Meg's, Meg's latest rethinking, around, you know, her latest uh, reframing, I think, around her work is really good because it's got a fierceness to it that's, um, that's very useful. Wow, thank you for that exchange, um, Ben and Chris. And Pauline, you're up next. Hi, Chris. Thank Hi, you. neighbor. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. I, I was really not familiar with this framework, and I think it's a wonderful way for me to learn a lot. Um, and now you sort of answered my, or you, you touched a little bit on my question, but maybe you can expand more. What is the role of the artist in all of this? Well, I mean, I think the, the ways of knowing about um, our world in the complex domain is why we have art as human beings. Um, you know, I think we've, I think we've always made, uh, well, for, there's a couple of things. First of all, it's like knowing about the world in the complex domain, the more ways of knowing the better we are because we, we, you know, to, so to, just to say, look, we're going to exclude everything else except do some data gathering. You can already see where that goes when you're facing a complex problem. So the opposite of that would be, well, what are all the other ways we know about doing this? And so artists can play an incredible role in being able to capture channel uh, facilitate um, uh, that kind of knowing, that way of knowing. Well, I think the other role that artists have too in all of this, and I think we all need to become artists in all of this, is a, a couple of things. When we're moving forward, there's a level of creativity that's needed to be in the emergent and a level of tolerance of not quite sure how it's going to show up, like a level of, of um, skill with improvisation, for example. And I think all, all artists are improvisers, you know, whether you make a mark or sing a note or or, or take one photo and it, you know, it shifts. It, being shifted and changed by what you see going around you is a fundamental piece of um, artistic practice that I think is something that, uh, you know, we, we, we don't call our work the art of hosting by accident. We definitely, it is definitely an art. And it definitely is informed by artistic and creative process, both by how we take in and see the world, how we work with other people, how we, um, how we improvise and let ourselves be changed by what we're learning and what we're producing. And by extending, I think, creatively extending the different ways of doing things um, away from what we assume is safe and comfortable. You know, I mean, I think, all, I think another way of saying it too is that all change in the complex domain will come from the margins. It's going to come from away from what you know. It's going to come from outside of what you've already done before. 
And so bringing in the margins is something that artists um, traditionally, bringing in new ways of seeing and new ways of viewing is something that artists, a role that artists play in human culture. And it's a reason why human beings have become very good at adapting to complex change because we have artistic practice. So I think, it's, I think that's something of the answer to the question. Thanks. From my perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you for that, Chris. And we have Roshanda. Go ahead. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much um, for this seminar. It's been so helpful for me. Um, I guess my question really is, when you're stepping in, up to a situation, what type of questions can you ask to figure out what um, sort of quadrant the situation is in? Like what sort of powerful questions can you ask the people to figure, to discern where you're at on the map? Okay. Now let me tell you a really grounded story and how I use this framework. Um, a few years ago I was working with, uh, um, I can't remember what they were called, but I think a health advisory committee or something of a university here in British Columbia called Royal Roads University. And Royal Roads is a really unique kind of university because they offer a lot, mostly interdisciplinary um, a lot of graduate level interdisciplinary leadership programs and they offer, they kind of target different sectors. Um, and so they have a healthcare advisory committee that um, looks at the whole healthcare system and brings its, its knowledge and wisdom and stories and needs to rural roads so that rural roads can make some decisions about, um, you know, planning some curriculum, you know, creating the kinds of leaders that are needed for the health system. So we were having a meeting when they have an annual meeting every year and we decided to use the Kniven framework to understand uh, better what it was that we were looking at. So 10 or, 10 or 12 people, I think, in a room. And we spent the morning telling stories about like what's going on out there. And I think that was the powerful question I used. Is like, what are you seeing? What's happening? Tell me a story about um, uh, what's happening. Sometimes we can use, if you, actually if you go on my, on my website and there's a link on the invitation page, in the facilitation resources section of my website, like the first link or the second link there is a project planning tool called the Chaotic Stepping Stones, which is something we use in the Art of Hosting community. And there's a whole bunch of questions in there that help to begin that conversation. But the ones around the need part of that planning document um, are the ones I'm talking about here. So for example, what time is it in the world? And so a question like that asks, to the healthcare advisory committee, what time is it for healthcare? What is, you know, what's the, the feeling of the times? Uh, elicited all kinds of stories, big ones, small ones. And all I did for the whole morning was to sit listening to every single story that came in and just writing on a post-it note a headline that captured what that anecdote was all about. Stories are really important because stories, again, are how humans make, make sense of what's happening in a complex and an emerging system. Um, and so we had, so we heard stories and I captured maybe a hundred or so post-it notes over the course of the morning with people just trading stories back and forth. Um, and be, just before lunch, I put them all up in the middle of a big Kniven framework that was up on the wall. And I said, your job before we all go get some food is to figure out where these all go. And they began clustering them um, uh, using the causality piece that I described. It's like, does this have an easy cause and an easy effect? Is this one knowable? Is this one unknowable? And they began um, sort of pushing them out into the quadrants um, in an exercise which, if you look on the Cognitive Edge website, where uh, Dave Snowden has developed all this material, you will see uh, this exercise is called butterfly stamping. This variety of the exercise is called butterfly stamping. And, um, and that's how they began to make sense of some of the stuff that was facing them. And so what ended up happening was that we could look and see, for example, that there were some reasonably simple things that we could do to address needs in the healthcare system um, that could be addressed with curriculum, for example, and I'm just, I'm blanking on things that come to mind, but just basic curriculum around management capabilities. Um, there were other things that were like more complex. So for example, I remember them saying, you know, one of the things we've got to do is we're not preparing nurses to take on leadership roles until they've been in their job for 10 or 15 years and they know they're going to be assuming a non-clinical position, and then we train them in leadership. But what we really need to be doing is exposing nurses to leadership training at a much earlier age so that they can be taking leadership responsibilities and taking on adaptable challenges while they're doing clinical work at the same time. So that's more of a complex problem um, that could be solved a little bit by curriculum, 
a little bit by simply reaching out to nurses and saying, hey, are you up for some leadership training? Um, and then also uh, looking at the complex problem of why is it that nurses who are working in clinical settings don't get an opportunity to engage in adaptive leadership practice all the time, and that's a much more complex uh, situation. So that's how I, that's, that's a story. I mean, and I think most of the times I've used this model in that way, it's been kind of a variation on that. Hi, this is Bidisha. I have two questions. One is, have you tried this butterfly stamping activity in a room of people who are all working on different things? And if so, um, do you think this is constructive activity um, in that context? And then the second one is, have you worked, have you exposed like highly technically minded folks like engineers and so on to the Kinefin framework? And if so, what tends to be their reaction? Yeah. Um, so yes, with uh, people working on all different things, I mean, it's a useful framework to use when you're, um, when they're writ large, when, when there's a big uh, problem that we're addressing or some big issue we're moving forward on. And we can all be working on many different aspects of that or many different things within that. So for example, you could, you could work it with people who are working on a community, you know, like a city. Um, and it would, it would, you could do massive amount of data gathering. Um, Dave uh, Snowden's work has a lot on meeting making, and you can, you can look more there. I think probably the biggest thing I've worked on like that is with a group um, of immigrant and refugee uh, uh, service providers in the United States. And um, we were, you know, everybody was doing something different, but we were trying to understand this, this world of immigrant and refugee issues, which is huge. Um, but everybody's doing massively different things. And so the Kinevin framework kind of helps us to understand the nature of the different kinds of challenges that the people that we were with were working with. So that's one thing I'll say. Um, at any rate, uh, Badisha, what I would say is that it's, the, it's, the, um, it's all about understanding the context you're working in, I think. I think that's, that's probably the most important thing. And sometimes the contexts we're working in are bigger than we think they are. Um, with respect to the question about engineers and technical people, I find, I mean, I don't want to generalize again, but I do, I find in general that um, I've worked with a lot of different kinds of engineers, and engineers are, are have a, an incredible mindset because once they understand something, then they're just like insanely curious about how it works. And so the Kinevin framework is a really, has been in my experience, a really good way of working with technically minded people to um, help them to understand that there are non-technical problems that we face in the world. And once they understand that, then they're really curious about how all that works as well and how we move, how we move forward on that. So, um, um, so, it's just, so I do use this often as a way of opening up a conversation about the many different ways we have of leading and the many different ways we have of being able to um, address, address problems and solve problems at the same time. And it helps, I think, with those of us who, <laughs> I'll put my hand up first. Those of us who in the past get impatient with technical minded people who just seem to see everything as a problem to be solved, it does help us to see that that's an important skill set. I mean, obviously it's an important skill set, you know, like we're not going to build windmills by having a bunch of open space meetings, you know, we've got to build infrastructure with technical people that are like material scientists and engineers who know what they're doing. Well, wonderful. Thank you. And Chris, I know you've got a ferry to catch, so um, uh, we don't have any other hands up right now. So I'm thinking maybe um, some closing thoughts from you. And, um, and again, I'll let people know about the next upcoming Art of Hosting teleseminar that follows yours, as you've indicated. And this one is May 10th, Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific time. So back Back to you, Chris, for some closing comments. So uh, hopefully they won't break up too much. But I just, um, yeah, I would say that if you want to learn more about Kniven, um, the Cognitive Edge, just Google Cognitive Edge, and you'll find their website uh, with tons and tons of materials. Many of their materials are open source. Um, Dave Snowden is the guy that's built this framework, and he's a uh, an irascible and, and orthodox practitioner of this. So, uh, uh, yeah, so he's, got, he's just a real character. And I think his, um, 
his work has been very useful to me in this work, this Kniffin piece has been very useful for me in understanding the rationale for adoptive and participatory leadership practices. And um, that's mostly how I'm using it these days as, as a way of, of, um, of, of being able to understand the world that we're, that we're in and of being able to assemble together teams and groups of people that have the skills and the abilities to, to both add something to what we're facing right now and to be able to learn and cross, cross over some of these domains um, uh, to get us where, where we need to go in the future. So that's all I'll say in wrapping up. And thanks, for, uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for the great questions. And, and Carolyn, thanks for hosting.